most of you know me, I am Lee Stein, and about September of, or October of last fall, Joe Girasi gave me a call. You're a rower. I said, yes. He said, well, I have this idea that Chautauqua Lake needs a rowing club, a rowing association. And uh, he was just a tremendous inspiration, has incredible energy, and is probably the youngest 79-year-old uh, that I've ever met. Uh, his energy and enthusiasm for this has just been fantastic. Uh, we have three young men who recently graduated college and who were rowers in college, and they are Eric Larson, Sevor Jawalski, and Kevin Sixby, who's out of town today. Kevin is our president, I'm chairman, and um, we, we have met, I think, uh, every week and emailed almost every day. An incredible amount of work activity in order to get this organization to where it is. Uh, we are applying for a 501c3 status so we can accept your donations. And uh, we have worked with the city. We've, we've talked to many municipalities. Rowing is a fantastic sport. It's a lifelong sport. Uh, I'm probably in the best shape I've been in my life because I've been rowing pretty regularly for the past three years. Uh, we think it's a great sport to introduce to the children of this area. Uh, there's great scholarships for it. So what I'd like to do is introduce Joe and Joe Girasi, and Joe will introduce Phil. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, it is kind of uh, intimidating when uh, three of the board members' ages uh, don't even add up to mine. But, uh, <laughs> yesterday, I would have said four. But anyway, uh, uh, thank you. I'm privileged to uh, uh, be here. and. Uh, uh, also privileged to uh, make the introduction that I'm about to make and frankly uh, I looked long and hard at the long list of connections that Phil Graven had had over the years uh, and uh, uh, successes that you'll hear about uh, later. Uh, many of you know that I was uh, Ag Commissioner for a while in New York State and Phil Gravink is a good example of a successful farmer. He got out of it very quickly <laughs> into something more profitable. <laughs> uh, but don't write that down. All right. The best thing I could do for an introduction for uh, this uh, hero of Climber in Chautauqua County is to read from the official record, congressional record, when Senator Smith of New Hampshire uh, rose and he said, Mr. President, I rise today to honor Phil Gravink, the senior statesman of New York, I'm sorry, New Hampshire's ski industry. Phil Gravink is one of the industry's most respected and experienced leaders. He is currently a director of uh, Adatash uh, Bear Peak Resort in Bartlett. This resort is New Hampshire's largest and is a vital part of the state's economy, attracting skiers from all over New England and bringing in millions of dollars in revenue. Phil is a resident of Jackson and has devoted 36 years to operating ski resorts, 22 of which have been in New Hampshire. Phil Gravink has had a truly successful and distinguished career. He served as chairman of the National Ski Association, the American Ski Federation as well. In 1963, he founded Peak and Peak uh, in western New York. He then served as superintendent of Gore Mountain Ski Area in New York until he came to New Hampshire in 1977, their gain, our loss, uh, as a general manager of Loon Mountain. Now, the name had nothing to do with your qualifications, I assume, Phil, but uh, in 1980, he became president of Loon and led it through its most successful growth years. In 1991, he moved on to a Littleton-based snow engineering company as senior associate, and then he helped operate the two state-owned resorts, Cannon and Mount uh, Sunapee ski areas. 1992, he took a job as head of the uh, Adatash Bear Peak 
and oversaw an extensive expansion that nearly doubled the size of the resort. He's been an integral part of New Hampshire's ski industry. On June 4th, he announced his retirement, the plans to stay on as an advisor. Uh, Phil and his wife uh, are scheduled, now this was written, as you can tell, before the year 2000. Phil and his wife are scheduled to spend the year 2000 on a bicycling trip around the world raising money for the New York, gee, I keep wanting to get New York here, New England Ski Museum and Northeast Passage, a disabled sports program that his daughter Jill has worked to develop. Uh, what we're hoping is that we, and I'll, I talked to Shirley, she said they did the trip, one of the most exciting things that they ever have undertaken, and she may talk about that uh, later to any of you. Now, if we can get both of them to do a bicycle trip around Chautauqua County to raise money for rowing, we've got it in the bag. Anyway, I commend Phil, says the senator, for his critical role and unwavering dedication to the success and progression of the New Hampshire ski industry. I wish him and his wife the best of luck in the Odyssey 2000 cycling trip. Phil Gravick is a great businessman and a model citizen. His retirement leaves behind a great legacy it's an honor to represent him in the U.S. Senate, and it's an honor for me to introduce Phil now to you. I didn't know you got a hold of that. Bob Smith is a rather famous senator from up our way. He's about as far to the right as still or the hun, but he, he, uh, he still has uh, been very <laughs> good for the state, but no longer is in the Senate. I appreciate the nice comments and the invitation here today. Uh, we left, New, as, as Joe's already told you, we left uh, Chautauqua County and Clymer 30 years ago this next month. But we still call it home, and we still love to come back and, uh, and uh, meet and renew acquaintances whenever we can. I have to make a few notes on these glasses are so dirty I won't be able to see through them, so let me just uh, take them off for now. Uh, Chautauqua Lake has a great history in rowing, and I understand there's a few uh, people here in the room who are probably better historians to that all than I might be, but back in the 20s they used to have professional scholars who rode in betting races, and there was a lot of money bet on these races, something like the horse track. And uh, it's uh, one of those was Pop Courtney, who went on to be, spend the rest of his career at, uh, at Cornell. The story goes that the night before one of the betting races, somebody sawed his skull in two. <coughs> and he had to, uh, to uh, one of the only races he lost, incidentally, in a, borrowed, in a borrowed skull. My story could have been a little different had there been a group of innovative, ambitious visionaries like are now in this room following that period of, of, of Chautauqua as being one of the rowing centers of the East, if not the country. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. I'll tell you why I would have changed my story slightly. After our successes at Cornell, came back to the farm, <coughs> and in 59, <coughs> I got a call from the West Side Rowing Club in, Bo in uh, Buffalo that were putting together a, a, a eight to compete in the to enter the Olympic trials in 60 for the right to represent the country in, 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 in Rome. And uh, somehow or another, uh, two babies, which really and I had by that time, and 60 cows, kind of ruled out the idea of commuting to Buffalo <laughs> to row about four or five nights a week. Now, had there been a rowing club on Chautauqua, it could have been a different story. Westside Rowing Club went on to, and has almost on every occasion, aside from having a competitive program every year, have uh, put uh, several crews, pairs, fours, and eights into Olympic trials, and I believe it was either 68 or 72, the, the uh, West Side Four actually was the American representative at the Olympics. So this may all sound beyond your dreams and imaginations right now, but <clears throat> once you get the rowing facility, the sport grows itself. The nature of the sport the type of what Lee says about old oars, old blades, as we sometimes call ourselves, to come back and stay in that lifelong sport are all important ingredients. 
And who knows, what, 15, 20 years from now, a legacy will develop about this club, not dissimilar from that at West Side Rowing Club. <coughs> the, uh, while you're in the process, and I've already heard it said here today, and it's so important, don't forget the kids. All these high school athletes, men and women both, who have, think basketball, baseball, football, basically here in this in, in these schools just say come down and try rowing a statistic that I believe uh, Clay Chapman from Lancaster who went on to be a long-term commissioner of East, Eastern Collegiate Athletic Association told me that the, about 20 percent of high school varsity uh, athletes men and women in baseball, basketball, and football, never make a starting team in a Division One, Two, or Three college. The other 80 percent, even though they may have had aspirations in that different competitive world, just don't quite make it on those small teams. Not the case in rowing. So, by all means, concentrate on the young people. All you have to say is try. The camaraderie, the feeling of the boat in the water will take it over. Not all of them, but some of them will become more persons for life. <coughs> I was uh, asked to, uh, I was recruited by Cornell to the degree that an Ivy League can recruit to uh, play football. And I went there uh, in 53 intending to play football. In the freshman registration, Coach Scholl and Coach Stanford stood in the line where every freshman had to walk by and looked everybody up and down. And if you sort of fit the physique of an oarsman, you got an invitation to come and try rowing. Well, even though we'd had a championship six-man Class C football team in Clymer, when I got in there and with about 100 other candidates, that didn't count for much. And in, within two weeks, I found myself down at the boathouse, thanks to the invitation I got from the coach in line. That was where the good luck started. By the end of the six weeks fall growing uh, practice, uh, Pete and I were talking about it, Dr. Pete and I were talking about it, you're starting what they call the pickle boat, which is a barge that moves about five feet with every stroke. Pete broke a few wars while he was in that boat, but it got him onto the team. But uh, the good luck started is that we happened to put together out of maybe 50 or 60 freshman candidates uh, uh, eight persons, nine with the coxswain, who were almost perfectly sized physically, being that the stroke and seven, had myself and the seven man had almost identical physiques, arm length and so on, weighed about 180 pounds. The middle of the boat was about 195 and average six foot six, and the bow and two man were about 170 and uh, equally uh, uh, long armed and long legged. The coxswain was a 110-pound former wrestling champion from Milwaukee who uh, later went on to be the first name on a major law firm in Washington. So you probably, you, we knew his tenacity from day one. That group of nine people basically stayed together for the next four years with a few ins and outs on the way. And we're all back together as seniors except for our bowman who had already had, had a uh, early admission to a, to a medical college. We couldn't quite understand his priorities, but uh, <laughs> so so we had a new a, a new ball man in that senior year. The next spring, those eight who none of us had ever rode before won the national champions, were undefeated in the freshman team. Purely a, a matter of good fortune, putting the right people together. And over the next three years, we won three more national championships at the IRAs and then went on to win the Henley and the European International in 1957. <coughs> Some of you probably know there's a tradition among uh, college oarsmen that you bet your shirt. So when you lose, you get back to the boathouse, you go to your counterpart in the other boat cruise, and you take off your shirt and you can shake their hand and hand them the shirt. I had the good fortune of over four years growing in every races, first as a freshman and three years of varsity. And over the course of uh, those four years, we took home 108 shirts and gave away five. 
Well, those shirts sat around in boxes, and we moved them from one place we lived to another for about 20 years. And finally, Shirley and my sister, who happens to be a quilter, and my mother and mother-in-law decided that they'd do something with them. So they, they, uh, they made a quilt out of a select group of those. And here's about 55 of those, or 56 of those, of those bedding shirts. And we had it for several years, but now it is in the archives at, at Cornell of, of uh, athletic memorabilia. And this is a picture of it, which is a new rowing uh, facility going to go up at Cornell in the next four or five years. And the committee has agreed that this will be made, not because they don't want the fabric hanging there and getting sun out and everything, but it'll be made into a mural, full size of the quilt, and it'll, be, it'll grace the lobby of the new rowing facility. So. I'm proud of my sister. <clears throat> well, that was basically our record. I've got to tell you that 1956, 50 years ago this next month, was probably one of the most uh, life-changing events that rowing ever provided to us. And that was one of those five losses. We, were, we won the nationals in Syracuse and Two weeks later, entered the Olympic trials for the right to represent the United States in Melbourne that fall. And <coughs> we were heavily favored. All the New York Times, everybody said we'd favor. Here's some sports illustrators that said, oh, surely it will be Cornell. Well, Yale upset us by a little over a second. They went to Melbourne and won a gold medal, and we went home. But revenge is sweet. The next year in 57, which is our, all of our sort of senior year, uh, we beat Yale three times. Almost the same crew. They had three, I guess, two or three fellows that, were, that had graduated. Uh, the Olympics at that time being in November, December in, in Australia. <coughs> one time by a length, one time by a foot. And so it came the end of the American season. And uh, we, were, we had already been uh, agreed to, or through our alumni's support, to go to Henley, where Cornell hadn't been for 40-some years. And lo and behold, about a month before, the Yaleys got up the money, and the Yaleys showed up over at Henley as well. So in the semifinals, we rode against, we, we, we were, it's a, it's a two, a two-person race, a two-team race. In fact, there's a, a good picture around here someplace of the course. It's a tremendous course. It's sort of the world championship of rowing, but, um, we came up on the side of the bracket with the Russians and, the, and another English crew. And in the semifinals, we beat the Russian silver medal crew and took eight seconds off the 130 years old record. The next day is the only time that we have had that there ever has been an All-American final in the Henley Grand Challenge. And we were able to beat Yale again by about a length almost. And we're, this is our gold medal from the Henley Grand Challenge. The uh, our crew still gets together. These individuals all went on and distinguished themselves either in the professions or in business, and uh, we get together now every year. Unfortunately, in the last ten years, we've had four premature deaths of the ten of us. So <coughs> our numbers are dwindling, but the the widows always come, and it's a good group. And it's interesting when we always, of course, do a lot of reflecting and a lot of talking about rowing and about how the rowing is different today with the ergometers and, and the uh, uh, different the, the fiberglass shells compared to our old mahogany shells and so on. But more, than, more often than once, it's been said, the best thing that ever happened to us was when Yale beat us. I learned more by losing than I did by winning all the time. And that's part of any good sport, I think. Rowing is the absolutely con uh, ultimate team sport. Occasionally, the coxswain or the stroke will get mentioned in an article, but the only way that you really get mentioned is to be the goat. If 50 meters from the finish, the three-man passes out, the papers say, well, he didn't pace himself or he didn't train as hard as the rest of the crew, or he uh, was sick last night and forgot to tell the coach, 
Or the seven man with the halfway through the race catches a full crab and stops the boat. And by the time he picks up, there just wasn't time for his team to get back in front where they were before he stopped the boat. <coughs> These are tremendous motivators to be part of a team. You don't want to have your name in the paper if you're on a crew, if you're on a winning crew. The uh, Your efforts here will make it possible for those types of experiences to happen again here on Chautauqua Lake. In our camp in Maine, we have a poster on the wall. It's a bird's eye view of a uh, mate rowing. The puddles, or oar marks as we call them, are well up behind the stern of the boat, showing that the boat is perfectly synchronized. They're just reaching for the catch and on mirror smooth water. But it's the the caption on the on the uh, picture that I read every time. Eight hearts beat as one. That's Roy. Thank you. Two months ago, we approached the city of Jamestown um, to talk to them about any possible sites uh, within the city limits that might be a possible site for Boathouse. Um, this was after we've been in discussion with uh, the village of Lakewood, uh, as well as with Celeron. Um, but the city of Jamestown uh, took uh, a very active interest in helping us out. Uh, and what we've come to an agreement at this point is uh, is a temporary site. Uh, it's the McRae Point Park, um, which is on the Chattacoin River uh, in Jamestown on Jones and Gifford Avenue, with the intention of having a permanent site at the Celeron Jamestown line uh, on some new land uh, that is coming available to the city for parks. Um, now, that land will take quite a bit of development, uh, but we're hoping within a, a three-year span that that area at the Celeron Jamestown line will be ready uh, for a, a permanent boathouse. But for the interim, we have a temporary uh, place to store our boats uh, at the Ready About Sailing uh, Marina in Celeron, which is where we currently launch our boats from. Uh, and if you take a look off the back porch here, uh, we rode up our four-man boat yesterday afternoon uh, on glass flat water with no wind. Uh, so anybody who ever tells you you can't row, on Chautauqua Lake, they're absolutely wrong. Uh, I've never seen such flat water. Um, and right now, uh, it looks like maybe the rain is letting up a little bit. Uh, so we even might be able to get out uh, and have a little demonstration if anybody's interested in watching. Um, so uh, we have some, some uh, overhead shots of the new site in Jamestown that we're looking at, um, which the city of Jamestown brought. Yeah, yes, Al Cal brought for us today. Um, so anybody who is interested uh, in seeing those, uh, we're going to spread them out on a table for you. So um, um, maybe I can ask Al to come up and talk a little bit more about uh, the site and what uh, what the city is going to do with it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Chautauqua Lake Growing Association. And I don't know how I got stuck asking you folks for things, but somehow I did. Uh, what, what we need right now, they, there's been a lot of talk about, um, about the site down at uh, um, McCray Point in Jamestown. We need uh, volunteers to come and help us out for one thing, um, but immediately we need um, a coaching launch, I think is our most important thing right now. We have a site to launch, we have a storage facility, uh, but we have no means to, um, to keep up with these crews and coach them from the water. So what, what we're looking for is we need a little uh, a John boat, probably 14 foot with a, uh, with a small motor around 15 horsepower. Now uh, that's one thing we need. We also need, um, eventually we're going to need a dock. Uh, Al was telling us how the water fluctuates with this concrete retaining wall. Um, and it works for now, it's three inches. But at some points, as I understand it, it could be as much as a foot or more, Al. And um, so at that point, we'll need a, a floating dock. And I've drawn up plans, and we have that all up here. Um, we're going to need people to volunteer to help us build it. We're going to need financial contributions to purchase the lumber and the supports for it. Um, and that takes care of our dock. 
And I think the last thing we need right now is a trailer to move our boats around. I also printed out, uh, I don't know if you folks saw it up here or not, but uh, a picture of a trailer that we could use. Can you guys think of anything else, Eric? What do we need? I think that's it for now. A lot of help, donations. We have a pass-through account with the Community Foundation. Um, if anybody wants to make a charitable donation, it would be tax deductible. Uh, you make it to the Community Foundation, and uh, we can we can receive that, and you can get tax credit for it. Um, but I think that's it. Yeah. for the Scholastic Rowing Association of America's National Championship on Fish Creek. They expect 15,000 people at the regatta. Uh, earlier in May, they had another regatta, a statewide, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce figures that the rowing program in Saratoga, which is a county about our size, a little bigger, a little richer, but uh, they uh, uh, figure it brings in about $2 million a year. Uh, for the scholastic program, as well as the uh, other types of uh, regattas that they had. And uh, uh, schools have not uh, sponsored uh, the entire program. Uh, some have contributed a little bit, but most of the schools are involved the way that the schools are here in hockey. Uh, that is, they will allow recruiting, maybe, and uh, promoting hockey, and uh, uh, maybe encourage students to get involved, but they will not be doing any financing. Uh, and that would be true, I'm sure, uh, here. Our goal is uh, not, you know, some people got the impression that we started the rowing club for a lot of elite folks who've got money and want to have a little fun. Uh, we actually got involved because we do want to have a scholastic program. We want the youngsters involved. In Saratoga, they have uh, training for kids from the 7th to the 12th grade. Uh, in many of their schools. And uh, Lee Stein, Mr. Energy, <laughs> I get about 14 emails a day from him on th different ideas that he has. He's just uh, incredible. And these other guys, uh, Eric and Steve and Kevin, are the same. But uh, they, uh, uh, and I lost my thought complimenting you. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, they have uh, uh, in uh, Saratoga, uh, something, a program, too, that they're working toward that Jill would uh, support, uh, Phil and Shirley's daughter, Jill. And that is a, a program for handicapped, the physically handicapped youngsters that would be able to, uh, able to get involved in rowing. And they have, I guess they call it adaptive rowing. That's one of our goals, too, so that uh, those with the, that are physically handicapped uh, can participate. Blind students participate in uh, because as Phil and the rest of the rowers will tell you you don't have to know where you're going you just have to know how you're going to get there so uh, we, it's a program that's just about as broad as, as it can be and I just want to say that its potential for uh, the economics of Chautauqua County I've just touched on the surface the members of the board don't know it but I'm preparing a letter to them uh, not a resignation yet, but uh, a letter because of all the work there. But uh, a letter is going to be something like this, that the birth of Chautauqua Lake Growing Association presents Chautauqua County with a novel and put a potent mechanism to attract first-time tourists to our area via rowing tours. Using Italy rowing tours as a model, and I explain that just briefly, but Chautauqua Vacation Lands could develop Rowing Tours as a Lure, and Chautauqua Institution, and Lily Dale, and Roger Torrey Peterson, Lene Theater, the, uh, the uh, uh, Jackson Center, uh, and uh, Lucille Ball Center for Doña Opera House, and fishing, and the arts, and kayaking, and canoeing, and bike and wine tours, and hundreds of other events and places listed in this beautiful travel guide. And uh, they could be the added attractions. And that's what this Italy rowing was all about. 
not only the pleasure of uh, rowing in the accommodations there, uh, but also they have all these added attractions that the rowers can be introduced to. Now, what's the potential? I happened to pull out of my computer a list of the rowing organizations worldwide. And they're just page after page after page of rowing organizations. And they would be people that we would invite to Chautauqua County, do a Chautauqua County tour, if you will, a rowing tour, and then have all these side events for the family and for the rowers. The side events could include the uh, uh, biking, as it does in Italy, and uh, going to the wine, uh, the wine cellars. And if you survive those, you can go rowing the next day. But <laughs> so there's a great potential here, and uh, I can. Uh, our dream and our vision is to equal what they've done in Saratoga, and uh, maybe equal what they've done with the Italy rowing tour. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Don't buy green bananas. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, Phil, I'm going to do a few minutes and then sure. uh, let those guys, because uh, I know they have a program they want to do. Uh, plus, I've got to go back and do some legal work today. Uh, I, they, what struck me, I, I read this article here on the Motley Crew, okay. and what struck me is in literally the second round of 1957, and this is during the Cold War. Exactly. And you are up against the Russians. This is Khrushchev has just taken over, and we don't know what we've got going on. And I'm curious whether that was part of the psyche that was going on with the Cornell crew. Well, there's an interesting story that I didn't tell today. The Russian crew stayed in a in a lodge quite near us in our three weeks or so at Henley. We got to know them fairly well. We traded some small gifts, and they, their coach invited us to come after we were in the European Internationals in Lucerne, Switzerland, to come to Leningrad for the Russian Championship. Well, coaches and managers got on the phone and the uh, State Department said, you know, no way. The Russians said they could clear the red tape in a matter of a few days and the Americans uh, said, we, we can't get you uh, we can't allow you to go. I think it was about four years after that, if you recall, the ping pong team, team was the first American team to go to Russia. Right. It was in the height of the Cold War, but we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. They were professional oarsmen. They had done nothing but row uh, for uh, Club Krasnozemania out of Le Leningrad for three years, and they re represented the, uh, the USSR in, in uh, Russia. I have a, cert, a, a shirt that says USSR on it. No kidding. <laughs> That's terrific. So as far as the interaction was concerned... Uh, Total camaraderie. Yeah. Total camaraderie, yeah. That probably wasn't lost on some of the press. The reality, I mean, they were the... Yes, that, 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 that's true. They, there was uh, the English press spoke well of the Russians, spoke well of our getting along together and the friendships and the arms around each other. It was, uh, what did you call it, perestroika, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you mentioned the fact in your speech, and it was terrific, about the fact that what you, we all have learned usually are from the losses. You remember the details of it. Yeah. And you mentioned the foremost of that being your loss to Yale. What were the other four? I bet you remember those. I do. In our sophomore year, we lost the first regatta of the year at Annapolis to the Na to Navy, and uh, I think we might have been even finished third, I'm not sure. Uh, then in the, later in the year we lost unexpectedly to a pen crew in a dual race at, at Cornell. Our junior year, no, I'm sorry, that was our junior Our sophomore year we lost the Eastern Sprint Championships by a half a boat length. And then our senior year was undefeated. And the other race was, it was twice to, uh, twice to Penn, once to Yale and then Yale in the, in the Olympic trials, and once the Navy. <laughs> I knew you'd know those yeah. five. <laughs> Don't ask me who the, <laughs> I know you got a record of who the others, the wins were, you're right. On that. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. You're in, you're in line going for the football team. I mean, typical Cornell, yep. and here you are from Climber. Uh, you probably had never rode in your life? Never did, seen a, even seen a shell. 
So he gets sized up by a guy who's looking basically, I don't want to say physique. for rejects, but he's... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well, well, this is right in the registration. This was uh, unbeknownst to him, which one of us had been recruited to play football. But uh, actually, it ended up that fall three recruited football high school stars mm -hmm. ended up on that crew of ours. Uh, Clay Chapman from Lancaster being uh, one of them, and of uh, uh, Bill Schumacher from uh, from uh, Massachusetts was one of them. And all of us, none, none of us went back the next year. Our crew outweighed the Cornell line <laughs> for I think all three years. We used to get a little uh, press out of that. <laughs> So you go over, I'm just curious, so this guy really talks, convinces you that this is something as an alternative athletic endeavor, yeah. and you literally go for your first time and see a, a, a skull. Yes, that's right. He said, uh, you have the physique to be an, a, an oarsman, and uh, we'd uh, love to have you come and try grow, growing. And I was probably intimidated, but I knew I was going to be a bench warmer. I was an end on a six-man football team, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're against all these big schools from New York City and Syracuse and so on. And I knew I was going to be a bench warmer, and uh, I just got discouraged after a few practices and said, "Well, I'm going down." I never went. I I turned in my cleats, so to speak, and never went back to to the to the football team. So then you go down to the waterfront at some point, and the coach introduces you to a new subject. What did you think when you first explained it? Well, it, as I say, you row, you start out, those of us that had never rowed. Of course, there were other, it was interesting, there were other kids that had rowed, uh, other freshmen that had rowed in prep schools in New England, and you know, like Choate and uh, St. Paul's and, and uh, so on. Uh, but you get into this, what we call the pickle boat, which was wider, so that there was a, a gangplank down the middle that the coach could walk on and you had like six starboard oars and six port oars out wide and it was like a, it was like a garbage scow uh -huh. really it was wide and it really moved slow but he was able to teach you the mechanism of timing your seat your hands and your body to start to get the idea within about it, it was it was not fun it was just heavy and uh, but within about a week he'd get you into a into a shell. Uh, they had some heavier practice shells that were more stable. One of the real tricks of rowing is to have your timing so good that you don't, you don't, that you're a stable boat. And the, and the single skulls are even more that way. I mean, they're, they're round bottom and they easily tip. And if you tip, you don't get a clean recovery because your oar slows the boat right. on the way back. So uh, we, uh, it was fun to see. Well, he'd pick the ones that had picked it up the quickest and say, okay, tomorrow night you're going to go out in a shell. And, you know, he would load a shell sort of in the order of the sizes. We'd have what you call the engine room with the, the, the four biggest guys in the middle of the boat, seats three, four, five, and six. Right. And then the, the, the timing, the seven and eight are really the timing seats. We set the cadence. But the seven man has to be almost able to to repeat what the stroke is setting up to the nth degree so that both the front oars that everybody else looks at are exactly like this. And uh, in the bow two men to let the bow ride a little higher, they are they they don't steer, but they compensate as they look down the boat, they can compensate for any any tendency for the boat to go off even keel uh, by the way they set and by the way they finish the oar so that they keep they're, they're sort of the balanced part of the team mm -hmm. but they also everybody has to pull the maximum amount, so. and your number was i was stroke i was number eight i was i was i set the pace for the rest of the crew yeah that, that all the way through the four years yes yeah why did they select you i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> other than the boat worked by the end of the fall six weeks uh, you know, I think I did row in the middle of the boat a few nights, but the coach and his infinite wisdom <laughs> uh, got me back in the stroke seat, and I stayed there for four years. Now, we got this uh, picture of Motley Crew. Wh which one is you? Just, just right, right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's yeah. is that the way it's set up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, usually we start. Yes, it is. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. This is. Uh, 
This is the exact order that we that we were, and the coxswain is here right on the fold. Right. He's a little guy. He's he's the jockey, you know. <laughs> he steers and quarterbacks. That's a wrestler. Yeah, that's a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> you loved him and you hated him. He was a little. <laughs> come on, come on, you know. Up to, up to, you know. <laughs> trying to keep the right cadence. And he's also the lawyer now, right? Yeah, he's a, a very good trial lawyer in Washington. Uh, so literally freshman year, you have this group together. Did you get a sense there was a camaraderie among yourself? We did. Yeah. You know, I don't think I, I think I intended to say it in the, in the talk and didn't. The physical likeness was one thing, but liking each other and getting along mm -hmm. and not having a complainer, not having a whiner, or, or an arrogant person who just, we uh, we were we, we became team friends then and we've become we've been lifetime friends ever since it just happened that's that's where the good fortune comes in there are some boats that literally have uh, insurrection in the boat from from, <laughs> on the body? from not getting along <laughs> well, go through a normal week so you're Preparing for the events, which probably were they were on weekends normally. Normally, on uh, depending if they're the big tournaments, they'd be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. If they were just uh, uh, you know three, two, three, five crews, the, the, really the collegiate regular season, it would be a Saturday row. Uh, our coach always said you'd start the season at a low stroke to get timing and strength. We. He said, you're ready for your first race when you have 300 miles in. Mm -hmm. We would row in the lake about 14 to 16 miles a, a, a afternoon, going out about 4.30, getting in 6.30 or 7. Once the season started, you would, uh, uh, on Monday, you would have a long low row. Uh, by a low row, I mean rowing at 24, 25 strokes a minute rather than racing, which is about 31 and a half strokes a minute. And then on Tuesday, you would have, usually have a time trial against the JV and the third boat. Mm -hmm. The team that beat us most, and the reason we were as good as we were, was our JV boat. <laughs> on a given <laughs> night, it would beat us. And they went on to be an undefeated uh, team a uh, uh, junior and senior year. Okay. So we had, we had backup of guys that were a year or two behind us. And in some cases, our sophomore year, we were all sophomores except one person in the boat. We had people who were in the varsity the year before who were now in the JV, yeah. in the second boat, so to speak. And uh, but they'd beat us, and they would keep us on the right on. By our by Wednesday night, you'd have another long lower row. Thursday'd be a very light short row, and if we were racing in Princeton or in Washington D.C. or in Annapolis or in Wisconsin, we would uh, you know leave uh, uh, Friday morning, and sometimes even Thursday evening. If it, in a bus, right. and with a trailer toting, you know, five shells. And you race on Saturday, you come back part way and get back late, late Sunday night. Fortunately for us, uh, Syracuse at that time was sort of, uh, that was where the Nationals were held every year for about 15 years. They're now in Camden, New Jersey, right. on, a, on a very nice course there. But uh, So a lot of times, if it was a, if it was a Syracuse, just a uh, they had a team race, we'd go up on Saturday mornings. And, but that would be, we put in, uh, once the season started, probably about 70, 70 miles of rowing a week. I, if I may ask you a question, Greg, I, uh, the comment you made at the, uh, during the program here interested me. It was a nice piece about uh, losing is better than winning. I didn't say better, did I? <laughs> well, <laughs> more, 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 uh, more more memorable, more education. You learn more. You, more and, well, and you learn more by losing. Yeah, it's and, like and saying you don't know success until you've had failure. Yeah, and you know, as a crew, it's important that you know you you didn't drop the winning touchdown. You didn't uh, strike out with three men on base or two men on base. You just knew that you lost it together, and the the uh, the, 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 what we learned from those losses, invariably, we'd bounce back. And uh, there was no reprisal, no recrimination of the other guys in the boat. So, and I, you know, it helps you. I think it helped. I mean, we had some guys that went on a tremendous yeah, But you lost to Yale, and that upset you naturally. Oh, yeah. But you came back to win three in a row from them after. The next year. 
That rivalry still goes on. I'm right now uh, contributing to a book being written about rowing uh, by an uh, author by the name of Peter Mallory, who also rowed later uh, in the 60s. And I'm sorry, I can't even say where he rowed right now. But uh, And he asked me to collaborate with him a bit. And, and John Cook, who was in the opposing Yale crew. Now, it's interesting, 50 years later, the... Uh, selective memory that each of us have of those <laughs> <rings. laughs> And he sent the transcriptions back and forth. And, you know, I email back, what John said this isn't so. They were sprinting full out in that Olympic trials, and, and, and we were gaining on them, but we just needed another 100 meters. <laughs> and he says, oh, we didn't even have to... We didn't even have to push it hard. We, we knew we were out ahead, and we were just coasting home. Well, baloney. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't it get as much attention as other sports? Well, it's not the world's greatest spectator sport. I mean, <laughs> you go out on a day like this, and you sit at the finish line, and you see, you know, all these eight-hour crews 300 yards away from you out in the middle of the, of the lake or on the river for about the last 20 seconds. And it, usually they have a, 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 an announcer on the boat, but it's just not a great spectator sport. Gr rowing has grown tremendously since we were there. It was in the, in the 50s and 60s, it was almost exclusively a men's sport. But Title IX and uh, uh, the recognition of its lifetime values have been, uh, uh, I mean, there's, Schools, both uh, high schools, private schools, colleges in the Midwest, Notre Dame, Purdue, Wisconsin always had a crew right on the lake there, uh, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, oh, if I think there's, there's a whole Midwestern league, none of whom had crews, men or women, in the 50s and 60s. So it has grown tremendously, but it's, uh, it's, there's there's no uh, huge crowds. There's no big draw like a football, hockey, or basketball team can have. And uh, you know, let's face have it. Have you ever recruited a, a, a potential crew members? Do they get scholarships in colleges for that? They do now. Uh, of course, Ivy League has a no scholar, no athletic scholarships in the Ivy League. But uh, uh, the California crews, the Stanford crews, the Wisconsin crews. Uh, do recruit, and they recruit mostly out of uh, prep school uh, successful rowing athletes. And there's a, almost, uh, there's probably 12 to 15 New England prep schools uh, that have crews and row all the way to a national championship, uh, the Dad Vale Regatta in uh, Philadelphia. And they recruit from those crews. At a national championship, what's on? What's a normal setup are, as far as numbers of teams are concerned? So, in 1957, you know, when you're, you know, win the, the championship, are there eight teams? Is, what's a normal? That too has changed tremendously. Yeah. Um, in the, in the fifties and up till about sixty one or two, the national championships were, were a three mile race a long, lower stroke race, growing at 30, 31, 32 strokes per minute. Mm -hmm. 12 wide, all or nothing, 12 boats were allowed in from their earlier season uh, uh, performance. One shot deal. One shot, you rode up 12 across, the, wow. across Lake Onondaga, and away you went. And, uh, but from 60 on, after the 60 win, or maybe it was, a, it might even been the 64 loss, first time the Americans had lost eight oars in the Olympics since in the 20s, uh, the Nationals became a 2,000 meter, standard 2,000 meter course. And almost all the racing today is 2,000 meters. Now it's uh, elimination term. Henley is a one-on-one. -on -one. Henley, you, get, you go to the town hall on Monday and you get paired like the final, like, like the, the NCAA basketball term. You get, you get uh, seated and paired and you go from in our case, you went from, uh, I think, 12, So there, and we were lucky in our side, and because of our seating, we drew a bye, so we only had to race twice. But most of the, some of the teams had to race quarterfinals, semifinals, and final. 
uh, had, had to add uh, three or four days in a row. In the schoolboy racing there, and the other, the uh, like the ten extra or the uh, Elizabeth Cup, which uh, the gentleman that, that was here brought, they may have to row six, seven days. They may start with sixty-four or thirty-two teams and, and uh, go all the way down to a final on Sunday. Is there such a thing, Phil? Is a is an all-American team? There is now. That's the other thing that's changed dramatically over the last fifty years. Up until 60, it was either a college or a club. Uh, you, you won the Olympic trials as a team. Now, you are chosen by the Olympic Committee or the Coaches Committee to go to a national camp. You deal with ergometer scores, which is really nothing other than, than showing your, your strength to weight uh, set in, uh, not a rowing machine, uh, totally computerized, and then you fight your way down to uh, into national camp, which uh, takes place at the end of the week. Going on right now, or no, it won't either. It'll be going on after next weekend. The I raises is in, 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 in this coming week, and then you know, coaches' recommendations. That they'll select probably 80 oarsmen who will spend the summer in a camp. Sometimes it's on Lake Madison, Wisconsin. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, I think it's been at Princeton a couple of times. Uh, to, uh, and out of that, they'll pick, a, they'll pick a national boat. And then, uh, depending on the year, they'll either row in the Pan Ams or they'll row in the Canadian Nationals. So they, they don't send an American crew to, to Henley. That still is either a club or a college. but. The, the national teams now are chosen from elite athletes at a national camp. Can I ask you a question? In 1956, Melbourne, you're, I don't know if it's on, tel on television or not, but you must have been dying a, a thousand deaths watching Yale win. Very sad night. <laughs> very sad night. <laughs> were you rooting for them or against them? Well, well what, I mean, at the Olympics. Olympic oh, game. very much rooting for them. And, 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 and no, I thought you were talking about the Olympic trials. No, no. No, by all means, we were rooting for them. Uh, you know, if you wanted to be beat, you wanted to be beat by the best, yeah. best crew in the world. They lost in the first round at, in Melbourne. Oh. So uh, the Olympics are a, a, a double elimination. And they, the word that I don't know it's used in any other sport, but if you lose in the first round, or it'll depend on how many nations are there, but they have what they call a repet charge. Well, the repet charge is the round of losers. So the way to get back into either the quarterfinals or the semifinals is to win the repet charge. Like, I think in the first round, two teams qualify for the quarterfinals. If you're third or fourth, you go into the repet charge. Yale was third. Mm in the first heat. They had to row in the rapid charge uh, two days later, won that, won the semis, the quarters, won, won the semis, and won the finals. They beat, uh, uh, they beat Canada by a deck, and four of the nine oarsmen had to be picked out of the boat. It was an all-out effort. It was, uh, it was there's a, th this book that is being written right now uh, is, tells that story the best I've heard it, so I'm a little brought up to date on that. We had some, it wasn't unusual to have somebody hardly able to get on their feet, you know, about when we were in, in Europe, uh, at, on the road seat in Lucerne, Switzerland, uh, myself and two of the other oarsmen had to be helped out of the boat. We were, we were, we were, we'd used the last ounce. But Is we there a ceremony at the end of a victory? Is there something you drink? <laughs> drink? We weren't allowed to drink. <laughs> no, I. Well, well, we did. At the end of the Indianapolis well, 500, it's a class of milk. Oh, yes, it. indeed. You throw the coxswain in the water. Oh, okay. Yeah, the coxswain is uh, picked up by arms and legs and heaved as far out into the front of the dock as you could throw him. And then, of course, the shirts are are an important part of that. Uh, you know, you make yourself available. The winning crew usually the winning crew comes in last. I mean, comes back to the Dock last, and these guys are all shaking their heads. And the, the losers, you're still doing it in all the races, aren't you? Betting shirts. Yeah. 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 Some of the some of the I, I have a granddaughter that races in in uh, uh, 
schoolgirl racing, and they don't they don't bet shirts, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> you, well, that would enhance the spectator problem. Are you? Go ahead. Have you thought? Oh, I'm sure you have. Have you thought about the impact of that coach, the, the real uh, crew coach who came by where you stand in line? What impact that has had on the rest of your life? And oh. Just, I mean, that that one, him picking you out of line there. Thought a lot well, to be totally work. honest, you know, he was go he was going right down the line, and almost every, you know, non-overweight six-footer that come down the line, he'd he'd say, "Come down and try rowing." Come down and try. So I, w you know, I looked back on it. It was a t huge turning point in my life, and I probably, frankly, never would have gone down if he hadn't have made that pitch. Mm -hmm. But rowing as a as a as a whole, it probably gave me and the confidence. Understanding of teamwork, and what do you want to talk about? Peak and peak founding, or what do you want to talk about? Our new love of bicycling, or whatever. Uh, I'd probably still be milking cows and climber <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for. Were you? Were you are you? Do you have an oar at home? Oh yeah, your I, career? I have the Henley row and the oar uh, in our den. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have reunions? Uh, Lee, thank you. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, both at, at the university. Now, next year is our 50th anniversary, 50th reunion of Cornell class of '57, and we'll have uh, we'll have many, many Orsman and Orsman's families down uh, at the uh, down at the boathouse. There'll be one day when it's called the alumni row, and we'll get in and paddle a couple, three miles. Really? Yeah. Uh, but our crew, uh, we maintained a round-robin letter while we were all off raising families and going in six different directions for about 15 years. And, we, and nobody quite admits yet how the letter, but you, you had a, a, you know, a manila envelope full of nine letters. And the stroke would give it to the seventh seat, and the seventh seat <laughs> would take his old letter out, put the new one. We kept that round-robin letter going for about 15 years. And then we sort of got where we'd only reunion every five years. But as soon as we had the lost our three man to uh, uh, pancreatic cancer about nine years ago, he was an importer in Hanover, uh, or Dartmouth is in Hanover, but not. And uh, we said, you know, this is nonsense. Since then, we've gotten together. Each one of us take a turn hosting it. Yep. And we're going to be on the vice chairman of Emerson Electric's farm, our two men in southern Illinois in September, and we'll spend four days together, we'll play some golf, we'll have some drinks, and we'll <laughs> reminisce and <laughs> show our same film that we show every year. <laughs> you have, show. Do you have film of that? Yes. Uh, oh, Actually, uh, I've got our Henley film here, if you would like to borrow it. I would love to make a copy of it. Yeah, uh, the, 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 uh, the club might like a copy. Oh, sure. it's, it's quite inspirational. Well, as long as I get it back. Let's but you, back you could put it on a DVD or you could sure. put it on, a, on a, uh, a tape. It was originally filmed by one of our spares who happened to be a meteor, uh, 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 press, or, uh, what's the right word, media, yeah, in, uh, in, in college, was one of our backups in case somebody got sick at Henley. And he did the whole thing on a 16 millimeter wow. camera and then edited it and narrated it. And it, it's really a a pretty pretty good piece of so graphic you know that in baseball the, the debate is constantly on regarding the greatest team there ever was some say the 1927 yankees yeah. some are coming up to the contemporary era but if you were to make a classic race out of rowing what two teams or what teams would you put together to row well in all humility, I'll say ours would be one of them. <laughs> the 52 Navy team uh, was a great team. They went undefeated for something like two and a half years, something like 26 or 28 regattas, and won the 52 Olympics handily in Helsinki. Uh, they certainly were one of them. The Yale team that beat us uh, would be one uh, worldwide. The Ratzenberg German crew has broken two or three of our course records in the late 60s, and they dominated. 
And then in the 90s, 80s and 90s, Harvard has dominated the, no longer, but in the 80s and 90s. And right now it's a, it's a toss up. Somebody wins one year and somebody wins another, so there haven't been any real signature crews. But I guess those would be the four that would come quickly to mind. What, what, what crew holds the best time ever? Well, that too is a little bit because of all the changes. We were the, we hold the we will never lose our record on Cayuga, on Carnegie Lake in Princeton, and in Henley, because it's the it's the record for mahogany boats with hickory oars. Now they're fiberglass, and that took about 10, 12 seconds off of the time right off. So. <laughs> So that's that's the that's uh, but but for the for the mahogany boats and the, those records will stand. Almost all of our records have been beaten by the new boats. Yeah. This has been terrific, Phil. I know yeah. Jim wants to take a little bit more. I've got to run, but I I thank you, and I'd like to get a copy of the video. Okay, and Shirley. If I can get it to Lee. Uh, I'll make two DVDs Good. of this. Shirley. Great. Have you got our Henley film there? Yeah. Okay. It was June when we knew for sure. There it was in the Sun headline, Cornell crew to go to England. A lot was happening that week, and the prospect of the trip to Henley made it that much more exciting. It was the week when John Collier dedicated our new boathouse, and the last week of practice until the IRA regatta at Syracuse. That boathouse was going to be a honey. It had room for all the shells we had, with racks to spare. It had a dorm for the visiting crews to sleep in, and best of all, lots of hot water so the varsity wouldn't have a cold shower whenever they were the last ones to come in after practice. Mr. Collier seemed to be having a grand time with the dedication. All of us on the crew were amazed to find that Mr. Collier had just come in from a workout. He must have been tired, but Mr. Collier didn't show it a bit when he troweled the first dab of mortar onto the cornerstone. When the cornerstone laying was finished, we put on our rowing uniforms to give the alumni a show of what we hoped to do at the IRA the next week. We launched the shells and rowed by the docks a few times, but when that was done, we had work to do. We needed one more time trial before the IRA to see how we were doing. So we changed into our everyday practice uniforms and rode slowly down the inlet out to the lake. Coach Sanford headed us toward the start of the three mile course where we would have a dress rehearsal of Saturday's race. Our coxswain, Carl Schwarz, got us lined up and coach gave the signal to start. We did it just like we were going to do it on Lake Onondaga. We started high and settled down to a smooth, steady beat that would carry us through the three miles with nothing left over at the end. All of us were seniors, and we knew from four years of experience under Coach Sanford that it took precise timing as well as endurance for us to be victorious. And that's just how we did it. As the crews came in sight of the finish line at the IRA, Cornell had a decisive lead and was pulling away smoothly from the second place Penn crew. Penn was a surprising challenge in both junior varsity and varsity races. In fact, their JVs were only inches behind Cornell's when they lost a man overboard in a freak accident. But with only seven men rowing, Penn was still able to finish third in their race. The varsity race was in the bag for us, though, and it capped one of the greatest seasons in Cornell history. Not only had the varsity gone undefeated, 
but the big red JVs had followed in their footsteps with no defeats in any of their races. There were smiles of victory all around as Coach Sanford accepted the trophies on behalf of his two championship crews. We had our trophies too. Following the old crew tradition, we collected the shirts of the crews we had beaten, right off their backs in most cases. Sure, they were dirty, but we didn't care. We were going on to the biggest race in our rowing career, the Henley Royal Regatta. The shell and equipment were loaded on the cargo plane and were well on their way to England when we boarded our plane the next day. We all wore blue blazers with a Cornell crest as a uniform. And that same sign was there that always seems to pop up wherever we go. It wasn't long until the plane was moving down the runway and we were on our way to England. A beautiful day greeted us in London when our plane landed. We were glad to get out and stretch our cramped legs. Our first job was to load the shell on the truck that would take it to the inn where we stayed. The English called the truck a lorry and scared the daylights out of us by driving on the left side of the road. But after a while, we became used to the differences and set our minds to rowing. Although the races are held at Henley, we stayed up the river a couple of miles in a little town called Ship Lake. This way we could have the river almost to ourselves while we practiced in the few days remaining before the first races of the Henley Regatta. There was just enough room at that little dock to launch our shell, and even then it had to be guided in and out with a long pole. But the River Thames was a beautiful place to row. The water was always calm, and there was no one to interrupt us as we practiced. Our inn was named the Baskerville Arms, and they had a low motor launch called the Hound, which they loaned to coach. But the Hound wasn't as good as in chasing things as its namesake, because our shell could always leave it far behind. So coach would shout instructions to us as we went by. The Baskerville Arms was a wonderful place, but they were short on one thing, bathtubs. So we did the best we could with what we had, and it turned out fine. Some of the neighbors wondered what we were up to, but it was one way to get clean. It wasn't long until the drawing was held to determine the order of the races. All of us went into Henley that morning to see who we would race on the first day of elimination heats. On the way to the town hall, we saw some of the sights of Henley. The whole town was helping with the regatta, even the bobbies. The race was 118 years old, and it cost $30,000 to set up all the tents by the river and to prepare the course. The town itself was over 800 years old, and the drawings were to be held in the town hall, which dated from the very beginning of Henley. Inside the hall, we didn't see a sign of either Russia or Yale, but we knew they were going to be in the draw too, along with the three English crews, London, Thames, and Queens. We were lucky in that first draw. From the Grand Challenge Cup itself, we drew a bye, which meant that we didn't have to race in the first round of elimination matches. Russia was to meet Thames, Yale would race London, and Queens drew the other bye. We didn't expect that R Russia and Yale would have too much trouble. The English crews were good, 
but they don't have the same sort of crew competition as we do in America. The first day of the elimination matches was the 4th of July, and the English celebrated it with a dismal drizzle. Among the spectators was Clifford Goes of Syracuse, who is head of the American Olympic Rowing Committee, and Fred Guterman, an old Cornell coxswain, who seems to be at every race, no matter where it is. The English children were quite friendly, too. They thought we were some kind of national heroes and were always asking for autographs. It was then that we got our first glimpse of our toughest competition. It was a club called Krasnoznamia from Leningrad. We could tell them by their bright red shirts and the odd blue sweatsuits that they seemed to wear constantly. But no matter how strange they looked, we knew that they were a good crew. Everything was different about those boys, except the feeling of friendliness and sportsmanship that they showed us. We took a time trial to get used to the course. It was shorter than any course on Cayuga. It was lined with log booms on either side and was as straight as a bowling alley. The river was so narrow in spots that only two crews could race at the same time. The shell started from gates, much like the start of a horse race. The course wasn't wide enough for a power boat and a crew at the same time, so everyone had to pedal after their crews, including Coach Sanford. Close behind him were three spies, two Englishmen and one Russian. They wanted to know our time nearly as much as we did and came within a second of finding our exact time in that trial. As we approached the finish line in front of the empty stands, the crew was looking good. But somehow, it wasn't the same crew that won the IRA. Something was wrong, but what? We didn't have that feeling of, of complete exhaustion that comes after a well-rowed race. We took the shell in and walked over to the next tent to talk things over. We didn't know the exact time, but we could tell by the look on Coach's face that something was off in that time trial. Our trainer, George Quant, who all the crewmen know as Uncle George, had the usual oranges for us, but they didn't make us feel any better. Carl knew that something was wrong. The coxswain always does, but we couldn't put our finger on it. In the meantime, the Russians weren't wasting a minute. They were on their way out to their elimination race. They were going to show us just what kind of a crew they were. The starter gave them the signal, and the shells were off. The starter's boats were the only ones on that river fast enough to keep up with the shells, but they were incredibly long. The structures by the side of the log boom were course markers that showed the crowd at the finish line who was ahead. Although they couldn't see the crews in the water from the finish line, they could see the number at the top of the sign, which indicated the lane in which the winning crew was rowing. Russia was ahead of Thames all the way. They rowed a rather odd stroke that American crews find tiring. They lift the oar high above the water before they slam it in. It's a fast stroke, fast on the start, and a crew that rows that way is likely to get ahead in the first quarter mile. But it's a tough stroke to keep up for a long distance. When Yale came by in their race against London, they were rowing in the usual American style. It's the style that we row, long and smooth, with the power on all the way through. It seems slower than the Russian style, but it's better in a long race because the crew doesn't tire as fast. It was still drizzling as the crews approached the finish line. And at that same time, we were about to row out for our last practice before our match with Russia. We went up the river, away from the racing, to get the last bit of polish that might make all the difference. 
We took practice starts, lots of them. We had three sparrows at Henley, Jack Meekham, Glenn Light, and George Bullwinkle. Even though they weren't actually in the racing boat, they were practicing just the same. Because anything happened to one of the men in the racing boat, a spare had to take his place. On race day, while coach pasted on the number, Jack got out the can of wax. The sleeker the shell was, the faster it was going to cut through the water. The band in the steward's enclosure was playing marches as the dozens of preliminary races were run off. And soon it was time for us to get ready. Russia put their shell in the water and paddled easily away from the dock. We pulled our shell out of tent number six and Carl guided it by the bow through the crowd out toward the water. While our manager made sure the riggers were right, we went back up to the tent to get our oars. Coach gave everybody a few last words, as if they were necessary. Every man knew what he had to do. We knew that the Russians might have a chance to get ahead at the start because of that fast, choppy stroke they row. But our big chance was in the middle. As soon as the shells were in the starting gates, the starter raised his flag, and we were off. Russia did get off to a fast start, and the crowd at the finish line could hear it over the loudspeakers. Russia had a quarter of a length in the start and was opening it to half a length in the middle. And coming down with half a mile to go, the lane signal went up. Russia was still ahead, but now by only a few feet. Both crews were ready to sprint, and we were still closing in on the Russians. Russia was tiring fast. They kept a high stroke, always two above us, but with a quarter to go, they couldn't hold it, and the lane marker showed that it was Cornell ahead by half a length, and then three quarters, and stroke Phil Gravink took the beat up in that famous Cornell sprint. The stroke was up to 42, and Russia was lost a full length behind as we swung past the finish line. The time? The time was six minutes and 30 seconds, eight full seconds faster than the previous Henley course record. But before we knew it, it was the next day, the day of the final race. Yale had beaten Queens the day before to qualify for the finals, so we had our work cut out for us. Everyone was out to see it. Schoolboys were everywhere, and college men were decked out in their school colors. But once again, we had a job to do. Putting the shell in the water was almost second nature by now. But when Phil sat down in the stroke seat, he and the rest of us meant business. Carl grabbed hold of the tiller ropes, got a firm grip on the rudder, and we shoved off. Even Uncle George wasn't sure. We had beaten Yale twice that season, but one win had only been by inches. The race was soon to begin. The shells were painstakingly backed into the starting stalls until the bows were even. Then the referee asked if we were ready. Yale was, and we were. And we were off, and the crowd at the finish hushed to hear who was ahead. Yale was off to a fast start, but not fast enough to catch the Cornell shell. We were moving on them slowly, rowing the same style of race, almost stroke for stroke with them. But we knew that this race wasn't going to be won at the start. It would again be in the middle that the winning crew would assert itself. And that crew did assert itself. As we came down the course toward the crowded stands, we were still moving on Yale, and the markers showed the crowd who was in front. In the final race between two American crews 3,000 miles from home, 
It was the red-tipped oars of Cornell that led all the way. It was almost an even match, but the Big Red had the extra reach, the extra power, to pull out inch by inch over the Eli's until half a length separated the crews. Yale was not going to give up easily. They sprinted hard, but they couldn't make up for what they had lost during the body of the race. It was still Cornell as they crossed the finish line. Carl splashed his hands in the water and threw a spray over the rest of us. We won. The race was over and the cup was ours. We had the shell in the boat tent in no time. And we grabbed Carl by the ankles and wrists and hauled him out on the dock. All season long, we had waited for this moment and we were going to give it to him. The race was over and we had won. We all gathered in the tent to celebrate. Everyone was there. Uncle George, Coach Sanford, Sean Van Horn. Everybody was grinning and everybody was happy. Todd Simpson took off to send a cable to his wife at home. Bill Schumacher was giving the story to reporters. Dave Davis was signing dozens of autographs. Phil Graving was eating every orange in sight. And even Uncle George broke training. A few hours later, it was time to present the cups, and all the stewards and officials of the Henley Regatta were gathered up at the presentation platform. It had begun to rain, but nothing was going to dampen our spirits. Our eyes were on that big cup. Our Commodore, Clay Chapman, got the bowl of the cup, while Carl got the base. And each one of us received a victory medal. Last came John Van Horn, our bowman who received the Book of Honor, containing the names of every Grand Challenge winner in history. It was time to say goodbye to the inn at Chip Lake and to pack our bags, ready to head for many destinations. Many of us stayed in Europe to tour, while some went home to America. But one thing was sure. All of us went away with a feeling that we had just participated in the greatest event in our lives, and one which none of us would ever forget.